What's good, listeners? Our guest on Strike Accord is music producer Steve Ornest, the man currently behind Southern California's legendary Total Access Recording Studios. How's it going, fam? I'm good. What's happening, guys? Oh, everything hey, hello, is hello. Louis Vuitton, Tom Ford, Gucci. Hopefully everything all right. is good in your <laughs> world. Man. It's all good I like over your here. Uh, studio. That is a nice little setup you're sitting in there. Oh, thank I you. Know. It's okay. actually fake. It's just a background. It's just, you know, it's just yeah. background stuff. Oh, right no, so, you, so you're in the <laughs> AI. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's all AI. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Because I was going to say that you're burning like an essence sticks right funny. now. But oh, no funny. essence sticks being burned. No, <laughs> no you're not You're no. not doing no fragrance lamp in there. You're not trying no. to for any artist uh, not 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 yet i feel like you do need one of those like little lava lamps in the background uh, if, I, if i move the computer screen you'd see you that have a couple yeah, <laughs> yeah. Really? You you it. yeah. they're by see, the keyboards because that's that's what keyboard players love mm-hmm. you have to have lava. yeah to get a little lava see, uh, okay that's funny because i thought you know usually someone that's like a music producer like yourself steve you're probably going like oh my gosh less noise inside this recording space would be great i thought lava lamps made noise <laughs> Well, they're not quite lava lamps. I think they're like, I don't know what you call them, but they're some sort of like lamp device. It's like the looks... oil thing. They're like, yeah, this. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> he, knew, he knew what I was talking about. We worked uh, together. Oh, okay. <laughs> that sounds like because both of y'all are like the millennial soccer parents. That's the kind of vibes that you guys are giving me right about now. Oh I think I dropped gosh. acid watching those go. Like, right. wow. I have, to, I have to figure out how to dumb it down after the last conversation you guys have, because I'm just the music guy. I'm not, I'm not smart enough for any of that. I think we all need a little shift of gears. It was That was a very beautiful, intense conversation, and we are ready to to continue forward, right? Absolutely. And Steve, let's talk about you, because uh, you had an incredible upbringing as a child, uh, learning piano and guitar at an early age. But what happened when you started playing your Gibson now. Les Paul in the bleachers in high school? Very good. Very good question. So I was the kind of kid that would come to school with the Gibson Les Paul and had long hair and was wearing leather pants. I'll give you the full the full description. Leather pants, the Gibson Les Paul, <laughs> <laughs> cutting class, playing guitar in the bleachers. And this girl came up to me and said, hey, you're you're really good. Uh, you should meet my my dad. And I said, well, who's your dad? And she said, Win Davis. And so I went home and um, went on the, the family computer because that's how old I am. We had one computer in the house and typed his name in and, and thought, Oh my God, this guy's done all these amazing records. And so I went back to school the next day. And of course was like, yes, like, please invite mm-hmm. your dad to my next show. Um, and to my surprise, he actually showed up and was sitting there. And I remember being just terrified the whole time. Yeah. I'm like, this guy's recorded my favorite guitar players, you know? Well, especially when you're probably playing awesome. in like half empty room. And then all of a sudden the one guy that does show up that you do invite is Gandalf. All focus on you. <laughs> yeah, <right>? exactly. <laughs> yeah. So are you starting to sweat reliving these memories? Oh man, I'm just, it's pouring off me right now. You know? <laughs> um, but he was super cool. And after the show, he's like, Steve, you should come to the studio sometime, which I did. And he took mm-hmm. me under his wing. And we started this work relationship where he would call me and have me play on records he was working on. And I started kind of assisting around the studio. I was only like 15 years old at the time or 14. Um, and yeah, the the sort of storybook part of this is that my mom was the one dropping me off, of course, because I couldn't drive yet. Uh, she <laughs> met Wynn. They fell in love. They got married. So Wynn becomes my dad. Um, and fast forward all these years. Wait, later wait, now. wait, 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 <laughs> they, wait, 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 let's get back this up. Yes. They fall in love and get married. And, but didn't you say, did you have a crush on his daughter? No, that introduced no, 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 no. Oh, okay. You're about to say that. I'm about to get <laughs> real <laughs> freaky real <laughs> quick. <laughs> yeah, <I read>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. I love my Jerry Springer. I always go there. <laughs> would definitely be pretty wild. That'd be that weird. Be no. Wild. Again, <laughs> oh, yes, not. weird. But why? Yeah, I'm just not that interesting. <laughs> oh, but your mom obviously is. Yeah, she's the interesting one. But I do have everything to thank to Tenley for introducing me to to her amazing dad, who I now That's consider cool. my dad. And and yeah, and again, fast forward all these years later, and I run the studio now uh, with Win, and and Aww. it's been a crazy, crazy journey. I actually never thought that I'd be doing this. I always thought it was just going to be playing guitar for artists, which mm-hmm. I did for many years, and then sort of just like a magnet found my way back to the studio so no i think that's such a cool thing because i know even after high school you know you pursued a degree at the berkeley college of music on scholarship and what did you discover about yourself attending this university 
Man, the, the crazy thing about a place like Berkeley is that everyone is the hero in their own zip code. So everyone is incredibly talented. You're not really special anymore. <laughs> You're just like stand in line behind the other <laughs> guitar player that can play what you just did, but better and cleaner and faster, you know? So I remember turning in assignments and like in an arranging class I was in. And one of the teachers was like, hey, what studio did you record this in? And of course, like I had brought with me all of my recording equipment and I was living in an attic at the time. So I can make <laughs> as like loud and, and as late into the mm -hmm. evening as I wanted to. Um, but that sort of made me recognize that I guess the idea that I could record and arrange songs and produce was actually special oh. and set me apart more than just being a guitar player, you know? Um, so you felt so like that was a valuable asset in your musical career to actually go to school to learn music production? Because again, you were 15 years old when you had the opportunity to work with Wynn Davis and some of the uh, early stories that were, I was reading about you, Steve, was that uh, one of your first outings was actually being in the room with Zach Wilde from yeah. Black Label yeah. Society, you know, also the guitarist for Ozzy Osbourne. So I would think, you know, with that kind of, you know, experience, you know, some cats would go, why, why now? Why, why college for, you know, this kind of place that you're in? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, so admittedly, I, I actually dropped out of high school when I was a junior to just do this mm -hmm. full time and tour with bands. And then later wound up going back and getting my certificate. Um, but Win was actually the one that was sort of the biggest proponent for me to go because he's like, look, it's awesome that you're in these circles but you could always come back to this. My only fear for you is that you're 15, 16 years old. You're playing with guys that are all in their 40s and you're a part of, you know, and I just want to give you the opportunity to be around people that are your age that are pushing for the same thing that you are. And again, I wasn't trying to be a recording engineer or a producer then. I just thought I'm going to play guitar and very specific. I'm going to play hard rock and metal guitar forever. Hell yeah, Thankfully, one, yeah. Yeah, one of the cool <laughs> things about going to a place like Berkeley is that you get immersed mm -hmm. in styles and sounds that you never would have. If I would have stayed here, I'd be talking to you right now and I'd probably have super long hair and I'd still and you're be, gonna be playing bluegrass and Amish <laughs> country. Is that what you're trying to tell me? <laughs> I know, right? and Amish I'd probably country. have a much smaller bank account. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, and I, I wouldn't be married and I wouldn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Steve, it's my understanding that as a music producer, uh, your work schedule kind of consists of like 60 to 80 hours, sometimes six to seven days a week. So why is that? I mean, is there like no guaranteed salary within music production? No, I mean, there, there is no guaranteed, a guaranteed salary. Um, and a lot, you know, things in this field just take a long time. It's not, um, the best way to describe is that if you're working on a song or a project, sometimes it could take a hundred hours or more on a, on a, just on one song, you know? And, uh, I think a lot of people imagine being in the recording studio is like the band comes in, they record their song in a few hours and they leave, but there are hours, you know, sometimes 20 to 30, 20 hours of pre-production before even coming in the studio where I'll be involved with the band and making sure that the song arrangement is the best that it can be. And then when we come into the studio, there's experimenting, there's making sure, you know, that everything is sounding the way that we want it to. There's tone chasing, there's getting the right performance. Cause it's not just about making it sound good. It's about making you feel something and capturing lightning in a bottle mm -hmm. can take time. You know. But you just did reference, you know, sometimes it takes 20 to 100 hours to work, you know, on a single track, correct? Is that what sure. you're saying? Okay. Yep. So with that being said, how do you set the tone with new artists? Because I was reading a lot of things about you online and you do have pet peeves when it comes to artists. Uh-oh. Okay. Oh, I need to hear him. I need to hear him. Say right. You're the dish. Do it. Do it. Well, one of the pet peeves <laughs> that you had online was is when an artist comes to you in the studio and they bring up an idea with you, but they go, hey, listen, look, I want to sound like Billie Eilish. I love this sound. And why do you have a problem when artists come to you and say, I want to sound just like Billie Eilish. I want to sound exactly like Madonna. I want to sound exactly like a hot mulligan right now in the pop punk scene. Totally. So, and I feel bad because I use Billie Eilish as a reference all the time. And the only reason is well, because she's so popular. She's mainstream. Yeah. Especially, you know, four or five years ago when she was first starting to break, I would get a lot of young artists that would come in and with a song and the song would be really good. And it sounded like something entirely different from Billie Eilish. So I would hear it ahead of time and I'd go into this meeting thinking, God, I have so many ideas for what we can do with this, make it the best song it is. And instead of having a conversation about how that particular artist can 
fulfill their potential as being their own wonderful artist, their own self, they're trying to chase what Billie Eilish is already doing. And the problem is, if we go down that path, by the time that we do it, Billie Eilish won't be doing that anymore. So what you're doing is probably not going to be cool. Yeah. And then in a couple of years, you're going to hate it. And you're going to be like, why did we ever do this? So I just believe that the best chance you really have is to just do what do you, you know, and let's just make the best version of what you're already doing as opposed to change. And it's, of course, it's good to have references and it's good to have what you're influenced by, but that's entirely different than being like, okay, but listen to the snare sound from this mm. song and the kick drum from that song <laughs> and the vocal delay from, and I'm like, what are we even doing? Like, that's yeah. not, no one listens to music that way. Well, you know? clearly you as a music producer, you have to go through these unique challenges and how do you handle the mistakes and imperfections that come with producing an LP? Um, mm. The imperfections. Sorry, can you reframe that? Well, like, let's say, for example, uh, you know, there's there's some artists or I've, I've, that I've heard that, like, come in super prepared going into the studio. Also, there are artists who like to leave some wiggle room to get inside the studio to explore new things. And then there are artists that haven't quite nailed exactly what they want to do and they bring in all their uh rough tentacles into the mix and so you as the music producer how do you weed out all those flaws sure so it's an interesting it's really interesting like you said there are some artists that i work with that have done a tremendous amount of, pre amount of pre production at home, especially with today's technology and the ability to record a lot at home. So I'll get demos that are like fully fletched and there's amazing pros and some cons in that. The pros of course, is that the band is probably really prepared to execute what they've prepared. The cons is that they have demoitis and they love probably a lot of what they've already done. Even if there are flaws with their arrangement or things that I feel like could be better and could make the song better. So I just try to always, sort of lean into the fact that this for me is not about ego or about like, I'm open to any ideas that you guys have. Um, but all I really care about at the end of the day is just making this the best that it can be. So let's just try some things, you know, mm -hmm. and that's usually how I, I go about that way. Um, and yeah, it really, it just depends band to band. Some are really cool about it and some struggle and some don't want to do it. And sometimes you have to kind of arm wrestle over it and, you know, it's, it's well, you, get to pick, you get to pick who you want to work with, I take it by now, or um, are you kind of one of those persons that that is paid to work with somebody? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. I think that mm -hmm. um, I am fortunate to get to choose a lot of the work that comes in based on, and a lot of times it has nothing to do with like previous success or what their financial situation is. It's based on, is this something that... I want to get behind and put those hours into because I know myself and I will, I'll work on it until I'm blue in the face until my mm -hmm. wife's like, why are you still at the studio? <laughs> you know, <laughs> She's like, come home. You do yeah, have a wife. Exactly. Remember me. <laughs> I know. She's amazing. So yeah. I remember, so. <laughs> uh, you know, Steve, I remember in a uh, interview on the Howard Stern show with the Imagine Dragon singer, he was talking about how before he became who he is today, he was a music producer and a ghostwriter to a lot of our favorite artists, but he wouldn't dispel who they were. With that being said, have you been asked by artists who come into your studio to actually write musical arrangements that you actually created, but they didn't? Oh, yeah. I mean, so here's my, my take on it, though, is like I, f I feel like people get too precious about doing everything themselves. And the reality is that this business is always a team effort, whether it's, you know, like this, it's a, you know, if you're an artist, you're building a brand. Like if you're McDonald's, you have a brand and you have a menu and you have staff and you have something that works about what you're doing that you can, you know, and it's this, if you're trying to do this for real and you're trying to be professional, you have an agent, you have a manager, you have PR, mm -hmm. you have the label, you have producers, you have, you have writers that sometimes help I don't think that makes you less of an artist or less of a person. It's just people that are contributing to your brand and making it, you know. Just but how you. often does that occur, though, Steve? I think that's like the real question. How often does the music producer uh, give in his own musical taste into some of our favorite hip hop, rock and roll uh, country acts? I mean, all the time, you know, like, wow. yeah, I mean, there and, and varying degrees, of course, but like I play 
bunch of different instruments and I sing and I do all these things. So a lot of times when I'll be working with an artist, I'll have an idea of maybe it's an arrangement thing. Maybe it's changing a lyric. Maybe it's a melody thing. Maybe I'm just going to play a bunch of stuff. And it's, it's, again, it's not about ego. It's just about how can we shape the sound of this to like benefit the artist and, and chase the vision that they have. And if, if I feel like I can contribute to that, then I'm going to, I'm going to go for it. You know? Yeah, absolutely. And how often do you follow like the latest, like music trends and technology? I mean, uh, and how do you like incorporate them into your work? Yeah, I mean, I'm always listening to what's going on out there. And some of it I really love and some of it I just don't enjoy. But I think that's it's always good to just have taste, uh, your own taste and know kind of it's really all this is, is I mean, all we have is the taste that's in our own mouths. Anyway, there is no recipe for success. Um which frustrates a lot of bands because you'll have some sort of success and then a band comes in expecting or hoping the same. Can you do what you did for those guys? And I'm like, but those guys are those guys, you know? Um, I was only a small part of that. Um, but as far as the technology part goes, I mean, I, I'm, you know, our studio- I guess the reason why I'm bringing up the whole technology thing is, I mean, Marissa and I, we talked about it like a month ago. I also do a, a, a side show called Rage Quit Video Game Talk Show with uh, one of our CCS uh, video game contributors, Henrik the Rec. And we've been talking about all this like AI uh, technology that's been coming up, like GPT-4, uh, Ubisoft came up with their own thing called Ghost Rider, which is going to be actually uh, producing uh, dialogue faster for video games in the future. And I also know that Google has an AI out right now, which is uh, trying to produce music faster, lyrical and musically. Uh, so when you start seeing these kind of things, are you skeptical about the position that you're in as a music producer? Or do you think that you'll just enhance these tools for, you know, your tools? Yeah, no, I, I'm not really worried about that. I mean, I, I'd say that with AI in general, I'm cautiously optimistic. I'm always afraid that people are going to mess it up because that's just what we it seems so like we, we do. keep doing. <laughs> Humans yeah, are. We just just, we're just going to shit where we are. It's just going to happen. You know, it's going like, to happen. Social media is an amazing <laughs> idea. And then, of course, we just ruin it. And then it. humans <laughs> get involved. It's yeah. like every sci-fi book I've ever read was like, it was a great idea. And then came the humans. <laughs> yeah, I think we can all recognize that, like, you know, obviously the cameras have gotten so much better on iPhone phones you know just like how the microphones can be so yeah you could probably travel on the go a lot faster but it kind of sounds like you're you're not as uh you don't think this is going to be as fulfilling in in the long term i just believe that a great song is and and what goes into making like the hair stand up on your arms is not something hopefully any time in my lifetime an AI, AI can, can do. do. Yeah, it's I a mean, human aspect. I mean, yeah. there's there, an AI will only ever go so far and it's going to miss the one thing that, that makes that an AI, which is the human aspect. We are unpredictable. There is uh, a feeling. There's a, a, I think what you said, you wanted the song to um, make a feeling. It wasn't how it sounded, but how I feel when I listen to it. And an AI can never get that. Yeah, so that's what the humans aren't going to go anywhere pulse. without it. Yeah, oh, yeah, I mean, it's so true. Yeah, that recording technology is incredible where it's gone. The things we can do now, I'm sure artists 50 years ago wish they had this. However, mm -hmm. when I listen to the Beatles, I'm not thinking about the recording quality. I'm not like yeah. worrying about like, oh, I, if only they had better converters. <laughs> you know, like no one cares. Like they're just yeah, like, that's this a good point. Oh, you know? Losing in the sky analog. with diamonds would have sounded so good with my stuff. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the thing with AI that for me, I mean, and again, I'm probably the worst person to talk about this because I know the least, but what seems exciting is maybe in the medical world, like the yes. idea of a computer. That, that's a good point. You know, I'm all for AI. Just so you know, I love AI. I'm all for it. I oh, we, might, we, we might die. We might die. <laughs> the AI might on. kill us. We might be the end of humanity. Yeah. Um, but I am all for it. <laughs> there you go, Marissa. Yeah. <laughs> but Steve, you know, it's been awesome to have you on Strike yes. Your Brother. And can you share any kind of upcoming projects or collaborations that you got in the works? Yeah, there, there's a bunch of exciting stuff that's going on over here. And one of the things I was going to just mention is that I feel like there's a shift happening right now in music that I'm hearing. And what it is with a lot of younger bands is it's almost like a combination of like 90s grunge and punk rock, but like a modern spin on it. And there's a lot of newer bands. And the way I know that this is more than just what's coming into the studio and an actual movement is I'm seeing bands getting signed and stuff that's starting to get played on the radio. And it's exciting for me because I'm hearing a lot of guitar again and a lot of yes. organic instruments, That's you know, right. in, in modern music. Um, I'm working with this band right now um, called Willow Wake. We did mm -hmm. a song that actually got them on K-Rock and we're going back in this summer and I'm, 
co-producing it with uh, Jacob Armstrong, who is the son of Billy Joe Armstrong. Oh, yeah. Monday. Very yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I was say, I know the name. Okay. Yeah, so super excited about that. They're they're awesome, man. They're just such a great young rock band. That's cool. So, man, we'll, we'll uh, definitely we gotta try to be get them uh, on. scoping them out. Do and, uh, absolutely, man. Well, uh, Steve Ornest, it's been uh, awesome having you on Strike a Chord, brother. And thank you, thank you, thank you again for joining us. You're Thanks, so Chris. wonderful. Thanks, Marissa. Appreciate Thanks, you. Steve.